Thanks everyone for coming out on a rather bleak and cold June night. Um, just some advertorials regarding upcoming uh, events. Um, I know it's a little way off yet, but uh, coaching week will be at Wakery um, from, uh, from Boxing Day onwards. Um, I think at this stage the plan is to have the state comps also at the Quaker. Um, we may overlap two days of the uh, state comps with the coaching week. Um, this gives some people in the coaching week a bit of experience for that. Um, but that's mainly to ensure that we're finished in time so that people can get off to the uh, Formula One Grand Prix and other events at the same time. I think Joey flies around that time as well, for memory. Um, there will be hopefully the Stonefield Regatta. Um, on again in March, long weekend next year. So, again, a good um, venue or good competition for people to target that uh, new to the competition scene. Um, and then we at Wakery will have Orange Week um, from the 18th of, um, of November to the 25th of November. And so, there's a few events coming up, and certainly like trying to get people to get those dates into their diaries and start thinking about those things. In terms of upcoming um, winter lectures next uh, month, I think it's July 18, and you'll know that'll come out. Um, I'm intending to try and pursue uh, this flam analysis, trace analysis, and the use of strobe lights on wires just to uh, bring in uh, quite people with the uh, with the OGN and the advantages that, that provides in respect of making sure that your flams are actually working. Um, the lights might be on, but none of them might be home. So. Um, anyway, tonight, uh, really fortunate to have um, Anthony, uh, who's the chair of the Airworthiness GFA, do a presentation for us. Um, I was lucky enough, really lucky enough, to spend a week uh, in the company of Anthony and another group of experts when I did my you know, Form 2 rating. And uh, I'm just really impressed with, uh, with the knowledge that there is in terms of by the maintenance, but um, it became apparent to me that uh, you know we very trusting in terms of getting into gliders, um, doing daily inspections, and we expect things to hang together. Uh, and it's one thing that I learned uh, during that course is that uh, there are some gotchas, and things that you need to look out for. Um, and certainly that's kind of what I discussed with Anthony for for this presentation tonight. So hopefully we will. Benefit greatly and may in fact end up safe on the ground as a result of this time. Thanks, Anthony. Over to you. Thanks, Craig. Um, I'm going to be doing a presentation on the importance of being well connected. This is going to focus on some of the daily inspection and um, independent inspection problems that I've seen or come across my desk in the past four years of being chair of the Awareness Panel. And, uh, some of the things we can do to understand why this is happening and what we can do to try and prevent it. Uh, it's generally well known that if you're well connected in society, you end up being pretty successful in life. Uh, you can say something very similar for your connections in a sail plane. If they're well connected, you've probably got a good chance of having a successful life. It's a pretty sad fact that uh, in Australia, Approximately one sail plane each year is reported. And uh, so I suspect there might be one or two that we unreported. Tries to go flying or does in fact go flying with a control <laughs> that's either disconnected or becomes disconnected in flight. Now, I'm going to have to change that statement because uh, in the last 12 months we actually haven't had a sail plane fly with a disconnected control, but we have had sail planes you know, flying with other critical systems like wings and tails not connected properly, just to be, just to be different. Uh, in comparison, the, uh, the British Gliding Association, again, reported around three flights per year with control disconnections. Now, one of the things to note with the, the British Riding Association is many more of their sailplanes are stored in trailers, so they're being rigged and de-rigged on a far more regular basis than many of our aircraft are. Uh, the other important fact is in the BGA, they do not perform independent control connection checks after rigging. 
it's advisory only in the BTA. Uh, rigging checks and appropriate connection checks is a worldwide problem. Uh, Gliding in Europe have just commenced a major safety awareness campaign as of three weeks ago to try and increase awareness of this and um, address some of the problems that they're seeing with accidents in Europe. A little bit of background, a very famous quote uh, about aviation not necessarily being dangerous, but being very, very unforgiving of people making mistakes. And I think that is an extremely true statement for gliding where if you've if there are mistakes made, you don't get too many second chances. We're currently doing approximately 62,000 pilot hours a year in Australia. Now, that's slightly different to aircraft hours because many of these are two-seat aircraft and two people. Uh, I do prefer the use of pilot hours rather than aircraft hours as a, as a statistic because if you have a significant accident in a two-seat aircraft, you've got a good chance of having a double fatality as opposed to a, a single fatality. Um, the accident rate over the uh, last 10 years is relatively constant. That's, this is what's been reported. It's very hard to uh, not report an accident. There's normally a lot of evidence lying around the place, normally in several pieces. The incident rate is on the increase, which is a good thing. Uh, in outside industry, uh, you'd normally expect to see around about five time, five incidents per accident. We're getting about two incidents reported per accident at the moment. So we've got a little way to go there with our reporting. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've had eight fatalities in the country, which equates to around one death per 88,000 pilot hours. Uh, that's a pretty terrible statistic. Uh, the generally accepted number coming out of Europe at the moment is one fatality per 50,000 hours. Now, I don't know whether that is aircraft hours or pilot hours. It does skew the numbers slightly. So whilst that's a better number than what's being reported out of Europe, uh, it's still not a great number. Uh, and out of the incidents you see there, uh, daily inspection events uh, are pretty constant at around about seven per year. So that's what's being reported. I suspect quite a few are not being reported and um, being dealt with possibly at the club level. So that's the sad fact of reality. And over uh, dinner tonight, we we're having a conversation of the relative merits of uh, motorcycle riding versus gliding and uh, unfortunately with, with gliding we're still very much in the same ballpark in terms of risk as in risk per hour as motorbike riding. So what are we seeing that's disconnected? Um, the majority are actually for flaps, air brakes and ailerons. This is not really a surprise. They make up the majority of the connections on the aeroplane and they're all in the centre fuselage. Uh, with modern FRP sailplanes, you regularly have limited access and poor visibility of these connections. And uh, independent verification is often hampered or even difficult. Uh, the important thing to remember is that the majority of FRP sailplanes flying around the country at the moment are what I would term first generation fiberglass. This is all. Standard bells, DG one hundreds, LS ones, that kind of vintage. Uh, believe it or not, most of these do not have self rigging controls, which is a relatively modern concoction, and most of these have very poor access into those control connection areas in the centre fuselage. However, as I mentioned before, we're also seeing reports on wing root connections and tailplane connections uh, not being connected properly, which is terrifying. The other ones that have been cropping up of late, um, ASIs, particularly immediately after uh, annual inspections. Uh, these are often result in accidents because the, um, the evaluation pilot uh, goes and uh, has a minor panic attack and the ASI doesn't work and overspeeds the approach 
and then either PIOs or uh, balloons sometimes forgets to put the wheel down or combinations of all three events all at once uh, resulting in an arrival. Uh, we've, but we've also seen other bits and pieces not connected, again, associated with uh, airworthiness work at the annual inspection uh, and they're being discovered during the evaluation final shortly afterwards. So a few examples, a very famous one in 2017 was a Jant R3 where the elevator became disconnected in flight. It was a post annual inspection evaluation flight. The aircraft was rigged and an independent inspection was carried out. The aircraft was aerotowed to altitude and the pilot released and then started going through the evaluation flight regime, carry out a straight ahead stall. Uh, the pilot wanted to do some spins and uh, went looking for a thermal. As they flew under a cloud, the nose dropped suddenly and the sailplane accelerated to 65 knots. There was no response from input on the control column to the elevator. After flying straight and level for some time, the pilot noticed that the speed was cycling between 55 and 65 knots. That's the natural fugal in motion of the aircraft when you don't have any control over the elevator. It's called stick free stability. Uh, and the aircraft were just hunting, oscillating between that speed range. Uh, the pilot experimented with damping the oscillation the speed with shifting their weight fore and after the cockpit, which was pretty game. At 1,600 feet above ground, the pilot decided not to bail out, which I think personally was a pretty poor decision, and chose to attempt a landing. After a wide circuit and a long final, they used a small amount of air brake as they crossed the threshold. And the, uh, the sailplane pitched nose down and contacted the runway, doing approximately 60 knots, uh, pushed the main wheel back up into the fuselage and shoved the tail wheel up into the tail uh, As soon as the air brake was open, I think the pilot rapidly realised that they were now a passenger in the aeroplane, uh, arriving at the ground uh, close to 120 kilometres an hour. That's a photo of the aircraft. Uh, a very, very lucky pilot. The cause. Um, Jantars have a interesting control connection where they have a pair of uh, hooks that go over a bar like that, and there is a sleeve that slides up the push rod that then locks that control connection in place. That sleeve is held in place by a little spring-loaded pin, which is being shown on the screen there. However, if the sleeve is rotated very slightly to one side, it covers over that pin and the pin won't actually spring out and lock it in place. So because that spring-loaded pin was not locked in place, it allowed the sleeve to slip down during flight and then the push rod disconnected itself. It's quite possibly that the, uh, the sleeve had been checked by having the independent check feeling that the sleeve was up as opposed to trying to look inside underneath the elevator and see that the pin was engaged. Um, again, if the independent inspection actually tried to pull the sleeve down, they would have actually realised that it wasn't locked in place, but they simply checked that it was locked up instead. A more recent one, a very, another very scary one, an IS-28 where the wing root was not connected properly on takeoff. Again, a post-annual inspection evaluation flight. Uh, a team of uh, four older gentlemen had considerable trouble rigging the sailplane. After uh, a lot of mucking around, they eventually got the sailplane rigged out to the launch point. Uh, there are two people in the sailplane. Uh, as it lifted off the ground, the rear pilot heard a crunching noise behind the bank called stop, stop, stop. On the ground, they realised that the IS-28 had adopted a considerable increase in wing diameter. In their frustration, the ground crew had forcibly rigged the main pin using the extension bar. Now on the IS-28, it's got 
a pair of conical pins. It has a clockwise thread on one and an anti-clockwise thread on the other. And you wind a central spindle such that those pins are then wound outwards and, and into the, uh, the spark cap connections. Uh, the lower spark cap fittings were not aligned and in their frustration they had used an extension bar to forcibly drive those pins home. Uh, there's a big note in the IS-28 flight manual saying, do not do this. Uh, the lower spar pin had jammed, the uh, central collar, uh, there's a little guide notch in that vertical bar there, and that collar around the central spindle is supposed to sit inside it. That jumped out. The uh, central bar is supposed to be straight, and that was deformed as a result of the rigging as that uh, collar jumped out. It's pushed that bar aside. That was not a result of the accident. Uh, and the upper pin was eventually wound, so it was fully engaged, and the lower pin was just not engaged or whatsoever. Uh, the, both people, both pilots were incredibly lucky because if they'd managed to get that pin slightly engaged such that it held at 1G, it would have taken off quite successfully, but may have failed at the first bump or the first turn with the increased load on the wing. Both the daily inspection and the independent inspection missed this. It's quite possible they only looked at the upper spar cap fitting. This one was another bit of a shock. Uh, ASK 21, uh, a <coughs> almost came off in flight. The impressive thing about this is we had two very similar incidents within two weeks to the point where I had to double check to make sure that it wasn't two reports on the same incident, but there are different aircraft regos and different clubs involved. Uh, the more interesting of the two reports, the third flight of the day, a flight review was being conducted and it, they were planning to do spin, so they had a spin kit on the aircraft and both pilots were wearing parachutes. During the air tow, the instructor heard a knocking noise from the rear and they heard it again in flight after they were released from the, the tow plane. They thermaled to 3,000 feet and carried out a control check and they thought it was the rudder. Uh, it was quite possible that it was the tail plane rocking left right as they kicked the rudder in. They just elected to land and uh, found that the leading edge of the tail plane could be moved up and down by eight millimetres. Uh, with very little thread left engaged on the uh, bolt that locks the tail plane down. It was, the tail plane was almost literally being held on by the gap tape. And you can see on the bottom there, on the top of the fin, there's a lot of dirt that's been collected. So the tape had failed some time ago on that lower edge. You can see on the side of the tail plane where the top edge there, a lot of dirt collects, the tape had failed there. And you can see that the tape has literally been been holding on to the S shape. So that diagonal bit of tape around the leading edge there was literally almost all that was holding the tail plane on. Two people on board. So we're not exactly clear how the tail plane bolt ended up being unwound to that degree. Um, the people involved in investigating it, the, the, the tail plane bolt had already been tightened by the time anyone came out to investigate, the evidence had gone. Um, it's possible that the tail plane bolt was not fully tightened during rigging. I doubt that, that's probably pretty good. It's held in place by a spring-loaded safety pin. Now this has a socket head style of bolt and there's some notches around the outside of the bolt where a spring-loaded pin is supposed to engage and stop the bolt from rotating outwards, uh, unwinding itself. It's possible that the pin has become deformed over time, people getting overzealous and pulling it out of the way to rig and debrig, and may not have been supplying sufficient pressure against the bolt to lock it in place. Um, the, that spring loaded safety pin actually protrudes above the tailplane surface, and tape had been placed over the, uh, the recess of the bolt. And I suspect what has actually happened is during the application of the tape, it has pushed the spring-loaded pin, the safety pin, away from the head of the bolt to the point where it wasn't uh, doing its job properly. 
the fix that came out in our airworthiness notice was a that clear bit of plastic tube. It's garden variety PVC hose. It fits a nice fit inside the recess of that bolt hole and actually then pushes very firmly the, uh, the, the spring loader pin back into the contact with the head of the bolt. And there's a clear plastic cover with a slot in it that you can then tape in place over the hole. The slot's there so you don't put pressure on the pin. One of the checks that you're meant to do with the 21 is to um, basically move that spring um, out of the engagement slot so you can actually feel when it came back in that it was engaged from the slot and the head of the pipe. And again, uh, this has been very thoroughly taped over, and it's most likely that people weren't checking. Um, but also, very clearly, weren't checking to say that the tail plane, Georgia DI, was firmly engaged. And you can see there's been a fair bit of movement. It's been like that for a while because you can see the, that the tape has had time to fail, and there's an amount of dirt's been accumulating on there. And so you can imagine that half a mil. A day was occurring, and over 16 days of flying, it's only way up to eight millimeters or something like that. Plus, if you put the tail, if you screw the bolt in, the tube you use, you have you have to use both ends of the tube to put it in properly. If you just use the one side, you could easily end up not putting it in properly. Quite possibly, because it's it's you have to use yeah, the yeah, right side of the tube. tube, but if you don't know that, you won't put it in properly. So we'll talk a little bit now about uh, factors that go into why we're seeing these kinds of problems. And uh, we'll make a little bit of use of the James Reason model, this is the famous Swiss cheese model of uh, accident causality. Um, so we have a, a potential hazard, we have engineering controls, administrative controls, behavioral controls. Uh, an incident occurs if all a series of those holes line up, and then we have some mitigation barriers. So engineering controls in terms of sailplanes might be self-rigging controls as a way of preventing control disconnections. Uh, administrative controls are manuals. We have um, the DI checklist in the maintenance release. We have the flight manual talking about how to carry out a daily inspection. We have the daily inspector's handbook published by GFA. We have Behavioural controls. Um, the most important one here in behavioural control is a commitment to following the procedures that we have in the administrative manuals. Uh, the mitigating barriers will be having safety protocols, emergency response plans, first aid kits for when things are hard and wrong. And the idea is once you've had a major event, it doesn't get worse and end up in, in terms of fatality, just remains a serious injury or something like that. So looking at why these things happen, we've got a, a number of causal factors to we'll have a quick chat about. Distraction, complacency, optimism bias, which goes with complacency, lack of knowledge and or poor training, um, pressure and stress, fatigue, normalization of poor standards, poor access, poor light, we mentioned that previously, and coupled with that, some age-related factors, uh, vision kind of stuff. So distraction. Um, research has shown that distraction is a leading cause in up to 15% of aviation maintenance-related incidents and accidents. Um, gliding clubs are social places. People like to have a stop and have a chat. Uh, people walking up and talking to our major, major distraction if you're doing a, a rigging exercise or a daily inspection or an independent inspection. Other members often need help and advice and they will walk up and say, help, I need to get this done while you're in the middle of something. And of course, the number one that CAS is very keen on, uh, a lot of their research at the moment is showing that in uh, CASA workshops, the mobile phone is being a major distraction and interrupting people during critical maintenance steps. So texts, messages, emails, the phone going ding, the wife ringing up or the husband ringing up. So some of the things that can be done about this, 
Uh, make it a club policy. Don't talk to people doing a daily inspection. It's a form of administrative control. Develop the self-discipline. Finish what you're doing before responding to others or helping others or even bothering to answer the phone. It's a behavioural control. Uh, most, my most preferred op option is to actually leave the phone in the car whilst we do a DI, so it's n not even a temptation. Complacency. Daily inspections are a repetitive process. Rigging sail planes is generally routine. And complacency is that feeling of satisfaction that you know what you're doing and you lose that awareness of the risks and dangers that you're facing. This is often coupled with expectancy, seeing what you expect to see, not what's really there. Uh, most daily inspections have been done many, many times but never finding an issue. So you end up in that train of thought, you do not expect to find problems. Divergences from the expected condition are not seen. Not seen. People look, see that a safety pin is fitted, not that it's fitted correctly. Uh, and there's been a couple of incidents now where people have simply said, oh, yes, a safety pin has been fitted. A um, standard Cirrus 75, uh, the pilot was at a, an event, outlanded, got retrieved, got dragged back to the airfield, rigged the aircraft in a, in a hurry late at night, wanted to get it all done. The all flying tail has a locking lever for the elevator mechanism, and you have a safety pin that goes through to make sure that that locking bar on the elevator is behind a certain point. The safety pin was in, but that locking bar was not fully aft. Uh, the independent inspection the next day picked up that the locking bar was not up, not the daily inspection. It's the daily inspection had seen that the safety pin was in. Uh, another one was a hotelier control, again, in the centre section. The uh, person who had rigged the sailplane had forcibly inserted the safety pin in a hole, but it had to physically deform the safety pin to insert it and had, had permanently butchered the safety pin trying to make it fit. Uh, subsequent DIs, the independent inspection had checked that a safety pin was in fact fitted. Now they'd actually fitted it through a slot in the, uh, the little wedge mechanism so that the wedge was partially locked open. Some time later, it was an eagle eyed person who was a bit more thorough had realised hang on a minute, why is that safety pin in such a state that has been bent to fit in that particular location? Something that's very clearly wrong and had been missed several times up to that point. So, what can be done to prevent this lot? Um, we've got a checklist in the maintenance release. It's there for a reason. Whilst it's very generic, it's there to help remind people of the steps along the way. You can develop your own checklist if you need to. Talk a bit more about different aircraft later on. Um, develop the mindset that there is a problem in the aircraft and you're, you're out there to find it. Lose the expectancy that it's never a problem. Uh, learn from others' mistakes. I do a webinar twice a year on airworthiness issues. A very large segment of that is going through defects and events that have happened in the previous six months. That's so that other people can learn from, from the mistakes that have happened before. The ongoing education. Optimism bias, very closely linked to complacency. Uh, it's the general belief that the chances of anything bad happening to us is low compared to the rest of the population. Uh, developing excessive trust in yourself and those immediately around you. I, we, they don't make mistakes. I'm not expecting to find mistakes. Very clearly, the problem of the IS-28, the people involved did not check things very thoroughly. They had very high trust in themselves and the people who were doing the rigging. Uh, the divergences are the same as previous. Expected conditions are not seen. People see that safety pins are fitted or that the other spar pin is connected, not the last spar pin. They're not checking to see that other things are done appropriately. 
And again, the same kind of things to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Using checklists, uh, setting yourself the goal to find the error. There's a mistake here, I just have to find it. And learning from others' mistakes. There's over 120 different types of sail plane operating in Australia at the moment. Uh, many of these have unique features to inspect at DI. We have a DI system that is given based on the construction method. So fiber reinforced plastic, wood, steel tube, metal, rather than type specific. It's difficult to train for every model that's currently out there. It's a weakness within the airworthiness system. We're looking, we're training people to see defects within the structural elements of the aeroplane, not necessarily in the connection elements. The level of training and daily inspection, unfortunately, varies significantly between clubs. Some clubs have quite a poor practice, which has been, been normalised, and I'll talk about that a little while later. And so they're teaching people mistakes as being built into the club. So preventative measures, we've got the daily inspection handbook. There's a new edition that came out earlier this year. We have the GFA YouTube videos on the Gliding Australia channel on how to conduct the daily inspection. We have guidance in the aircraft flight methods. Uh, the behavioural control, if you haven't DI'd the type before, ask someone for guidance. Find out how to do it. Preferably, read the manual. Another common one, pressure and stress. It's a real problem within many clubs. Uh, if you rock up to the airfield, the day is booming or the wave has just started, or more commonly, four AES have just arrived at the airfield and the pressure is on to get an aircraft out of a hangar RFM. The stresses can be physical or mental. Uh, physical stresses include it's a blistering hot day. We love flying on summer days. Uh, wave happens in the winter, it can be pretty frigid. Perhaps you're not feeling particularly well. Mental stresses, relationship worries, financial concerns, particularly in the current climate, too many demands on a given day, lack of support from others. These all sound pretty familiar, don't they? Stresses are cumulative, they build up on you until you're able to release them. And they keep on building up. It can be quite surreptitious. It will cloud your judgment. Things will get missed. Your mind isn't on the job at hand. You've got inbuilt distractions going through your head. What can be done? Shed low priority tasks. Learn to say no politely. Um, being more self aware. And I'll talk a little bit more about this with fatigue, with a bit of a personal anecdote. Recognize when you are getting stressed. Uh, Work on the teamwork and getting assistance with the <laughs> and having a bit better planning coordination at the beginning of the day. Fatigue, again, very similar to stress, very common. We try to do too much on a given day. Often you'll have one expert or perceived expert on the field with a whole lot of junior people running around and that expert's trying to be everywhere all at once. We try to do too much, we press on rather than take a break. Fatigue is cumulative. It compounds with stress. Uh, you're much more susceptible when you're fatigued to taking shortcuts, making mistakes of judgment, and that optimism bias kicks in. I know what I'm doing. It's not going to happen to me. Again, how to prevent this, learning to say no politely, getting rid of some of those low priority tasks. Actually plan to take breaks. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my cancer experience a little bit later, but certainly now if I'm planning on driving distance, um, I, we plan to take shorter, break the, the, the distance up into shorter days. So we're taking more breaks, more stops along the way, and we're driving less per day and actually staying overnight in town. So I wouldn't have done that when I was 20 or 30. Being more self-aware, recognise the symptoms of when you're getting fatigued. And then when you do get fatigued, learn to say no. Learning to ask for assistance. There's a lot of people out there who will never ask for help. That self-esteem, self-pride gets in the way. It's not 
a sin to ask for assistance. Uh, 15 years ago, I had cancer. I had four weeks of radiotherapy. As a result of that, I felt that I'd aged about 10 years in about 10 weeks. You know, I was getting very fatigued a lot more quickly as a result of that treatment. Uh, I was routinely using the Bergfeld two-seater as a, an extension to the club training. And on this particular day, uh, I'd been using it to help do upper air training for people. And as the day it died, I'm just going, resorting to circuits, I decided that I had enough and was going to pack it in with the Bergfeld. It doesn't really suit a circuit, day. but I recognised that I was getting tired. It was time to pack it in, even though there's still a couple of hours of daylight and valuable training could be done. Unfortunately, the, uh, the duty pilot of the day was uh, less than accepting of that. Got a little bit upset that I was packing it away. There were still so many people to, uh, to fly. And uh, I had to politely say, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I've had it. I'm going to put it away. Normalisation. Very insidious process where non conforming behaviour becomes standard. There's often a reward for the non-conforming behaviour. You get to go flying if you apply a dodgy fix for something. The, uh, the reward is you get to go flying on a good day, and if you get away with it, then that dodgy fix can become accepted practice over time. Often quite common in clubs that don't have a lot of interaction with other clubs a closed environment. And I've seen it happen in other words, in other areas, sometimes in defence, where you have a particular unit that is special or operating under special rules or is segregated from the rest of the defence community for some reason. They might be operating a secret equipment or something like that. Um, poor behaviour can become normalised within that area because they're not connecting with the outside world and there's no outside influence saying, hey, what you're doing is wrong. Step back, fix it. But it's that lack of an immediate bad outcome, even though you've upped the risks, uh, that reinforces that non-conforming behaviour. What can be done to prevent it? Independent safety reviews. This is something that we'll be talking about at the Ops Airworthiness Sports face-to-face uh, -face meeting next weekend in Melbourne. Uh, by respected peers or experts from outside the club, if possible, uh, bringing in people from outside to say, just have a look, look at what you're doing and say, is this best practice? Um, group debriefs of review findings. It's a lot harder for individuals to ignore this advice that's done in a group format. Uh, rewarding people, publicly acknowledging people who voluntarily disclose that there are problems and that they need to be fixed, uh, building in positive reinforcement. Often a lot of these things get shouted down with, oh, no, it's never been a problem before, or she'll be right. I'm sure some of this sounds really familiar. We talked about it earlier, poor access. We have limited view inside many of the uh, FRP sail planes with a small access hole. It's often done outside in the daylight where it's dark inside the fuselage and very bright, very difficult to see inside. Uh, often with the size of the access panel, you can either look or you can have your hand inside, but you can't do both at the same time. So you're either checking by feel or you're trying to check visually and some of the visual angles are poor. Um, it's difficult to get more than one hand in and you need the dexterity with one hand to check that the connections are made properly and the safety device is applied properly. Not much you can do about it because you can't make the access hole any bigger. But what you will need to do is make sure you have a torch and mirror or a stick available when you're doing the independent inspections or even when you're rigging inside there to make sure you've done it properly. Um, it's the only way to really verify that you've got it done right. Sensitive issue, age. No one likes having a birthday these days. We're all getting older. I did some research on the number of DI incidents and the match them through to pilot age at the time of the incident. Um, 
it did turn up with a spike in that 65 to 70 year old age group. I think it's a statistical problem because if you take uh, the four people off there and slot it into the 70 group, it then matches the curve of the gliding population very well. I think it's just a statistical fluke of the way things were bracketed with the age groups. But uh, we recruit a lot of our pilots in the 45 to 50 age group. But once the kids have left home, they're starting to give more time, a bit more money, and they're looking at their own hobbies more. Um, by the time they're getting into that 60, 65 age group, you've got a good risk of complacency kicking in. Um, your eyesight's degrading, right? 45, I needed to start wearing these. So I'd have my head down at P3 tailpipe looking at a known cracker. I couldn't see it. Time to get these. Um, reading glasses are now actually critical for many people to doing a successful DI. If you don't have your glasses with you, why are you doing independent inspection? Why are you doing why are you doing that DI? It's now critically good. So this is a, a guide that's a generic guide that's come out of the FAA. It is aimed at maintenance independent inspection. So the kind of independent inspections you would find in a workshop, in an FAA workshop or a, a CASA workshop. The first checker or the first inspector is the person who's done the job. They need to verify that they've done the job correctly. The second person is the independent inspector. The, uh, the CA stands for check for correct assembly. Check that what you've done is actually functioning properly. Is everything connected appropriately? The safety step are uh, all the safety devices installed. So your safety pins, your locking devices, things like that. Um, appropriate for aircraft maintenance in the workshop. Are any foreign object present? Loose nuts, bolts, tools, um, other bits and pieces along the way. You're not seeing coins so much these days, but you are seeing USB adapters and all sorts of other electronic gizzardry uh, floating around in cockpit floors as opposed to pen mids and coins from 20, 30 years ago. Again, appropriate for a workshop was looking for maintenance and induced damage, tool impact, things like that. Um, once the independent inspection has been done, close the area up immediately. Don't run the risk of having it become contaminated by leaving it open and then finish off with the paperwork. Pretty important um, if you're doing an independent inspection, you should read the manuals, particularly if you haven't done an independent inspection on the type before, have a look at the flight manual. Um, the check-in needs to be briefed on what needs to be done, but doesn't need to be led by the nodes. That compromises the independence of the inspection. Um, that mindset about assuming that the work is error-free, that Billy Bob, your best mate, never makes a mistake, is completely wrong. A mistake has been made, you just have to find it. Uh, if the checker finds any errors, it's a really good idea to say thank you because they've done your service. Uh, you should be looking in the hidden areas. This is where uh, the mirror and torch routine comes in for first generation file glass with really tiny access holes. Uh, even with the, the Janta and the uh, control disconnection on the elevator circuit would have been easily spiked with just a torch. The, uh, even though the access to the air is pretty poor. Now, if any stage of the check procedure meets a problem, doesn't pass, fix the problem and start again, recommence from the beginning. Uh, a common problem with distraction is people losing track of where they got to and then skipping steps. I mentioned do not leave the second checker, compromise the independence. Don't interrupt, again, that distraction. Uh, keep the rubber neckers and the socialises and the way this all going on. So any questions? Yes? Yeah, that lays uh, a bit of 21 incident. Do you think that more of you picked up on a thorough walk around the free flight? Um, 
Certainly before that incident occurred, yes, you can see that the tape has given away um, and had been parted for some time because of all the dirt build up there. Uh, and it would have just be held in place by the a diagonal S bend in the tape. So given that the leading edge of the tail plane, a rattle would have certainly identified it. And the previous umpteen times it was flown before then. So I know with um, um, each aircraft and the annual inspection and the AGs and AMs, there's obviously a lot of information about potential aircraft types. You think about your checkers, whether or not there's a, a role in the GFA, it's perhaps for each aircraft type to exclude some of the dodges or checkers slides together as, as part of the DI and the team. Providing people will form the GFA, then we can put it in an AM. Now that's the that's the real problem. There's a lot of knowledge out there that's not being passed on to yeah, the movies. When we do get problems reported, we're updating the air movies notice, the AM for that particular model type. Um, and some people may hear they've received updated AMs in the last couple of years that Dennis has added to DG 1000s, I think, have had a couple come out. But as we've found problems where filling in that information. The Form 2, or the Annual Inspection Checklist, uh, is generic because there's 100, over 120 different types of sailplane now. And to have a checklist that fitted everybody, you'd have six, seven pages or something like that. If you are a Jantar, <laughs> you have to check this. If you are a label, you've got to check that. So it would be unworkable at that time. There's nothing to stop owners collaborating with each other and developing their own checklist in addition to what's published in GFA. But if there are gotchas on particular types, then let them us know we can incorporate into the ANs. I think the ANs are um, a very underutilized resource. And many of the newer cell plans, many of the newer cell plans um, have checklists in the flight plan. Yes. Which many is, which is Tends to be the better one to use. Yes. Because it has all those unique elements listed there. And I would recommend that if you have a checklist in the flight map, it's unique for that type of user. Yeah. yeah. Um, again, the checklist that's in the maintenance release is a one size fits all reminder for people. It's not, and uh, last time I reviewed the maintenance release, um, for those that know Roger Druce wanted to add para whole paragraphs into that checklist and it just wasn't physically going to fit on the page or we're going to have to use really tiny foot. And uh, you would need uh, probably a magnifying glass in addition to these uh, to read it. So it would defeat the purpose of it. And I don't mean to bad mouth Roger. He's a, a lovely guy and very, very thorough. It's just that we physically can't include everything on that little tiny piece of paper. Alternatively, we make the maintenance release bigger, <laughs> increase the page size. I wonder whether there's a need for the plugs to develop um, uh, information documents, things that are quite specific to aircraft in terms of um, de-rigging, rigging, infusing, ground handling equipment, all the um, checks that you need to do for each aircraft as a checklist. I know that the Air Force cadets considered that for the DG 1000s, um, having a unique checklist for all that kind of stuff. I don't know how far that progressed. Um, I know of some clubs that do have something similar for very special aircraft that are very different, and they will have a, a unique instruct instruction list to be aware of the gotchas on those types. That seems to be the exception, right? Any other questions? Is there anything from JR at all? Any comment from JR on the on the chat? Double check while I still going. You got me. It's got his microphone off. That's okay. I'm sure it is. And I mean, another thing that I've found useful in when you're training somebody. In to do a DI is to thoroughly explain why you're checking certain things. What is the reason? 
um, in the DG for example, chicken. So the, there are two batteries in the DG ones, and you check that you get a voltage reading from both batteries independently. Because the battery in the tank is also very important balance. That's yes. why you need to know yes. that it's there. Yes. Um, or if you check around the tailplane bottom end of the boom tailplanes, why do you check for cracks and deformity there? Because that's where the pin breaks, when it breaks, it picks up damage. It's there. That's why it's really important to look at that. Bit. And I found that to be useful for students to, to learn why they are doing specific things. Yeah, the um the quality of the DI training varies significantly from place to place. Uh, with the GPC training, there is a teacher's guide and a, you know, a trainer's guide written for it. Uh, we've also got the uh, DI manual on the website, uh, training videos on YouTube, uh, how many more resources that we can throw at it with the exception of individually going out to each club and saying, well, show me a DI and we'll see if we can find it. Mm -hmm. Well, Harrison, yeah, so so any further questions? Thanks very much. So, um, uh, I think um, I've learned something out of tonight in the sense that I'm actually going to go with the DI in our area to be a little bit more um, thinking about what we're actually looking at, what we're doing. And so, um, so I think that confirmation bias that he talks about uh, is something where you just simply do it day and day in and day out. It's uh, one of those things where you just look at it very complacently. And so it's a wake up call. And I think the the, um, the areas that can demonstrate are things that can happen and you need to be alive to. So I think basically uh, we need to go back to our clubs and be champions for. We're ensuring the DI is done. This is very thorough. So thanks very much, Andy. Thanks for yeah, the Thank you. Not the greatest question. Um, not the but Anthony, I'd like to congratulate you on the work you do at Airways. It is absolutely phenomenal. You've punched out a bunch of books recently, which I see you wrote most of. And edited most of. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people realize the work that you've done. and and the responsibility that you've taken on, not that you first did the responsibility, possibly, but, but the responsibility you've taken to produce some of the best technical documents any global, any global organization can have is exceptional. And on behalf of everybody who's listening, thank you. Thank you very much. The, web, the webinars, they're very, very useful. The webinars have been yeah. really popular. Um, and I've been encouraging other elements of GFA to do something similar. Uh, the next webinar in November, I'm going to try something slightly different. I'm going to look at having an online questionnaire after, after the webinar, um, such that if you complete the questionnaire and pass, it will start to extend your revalidation date on your annual administrations. And start to push that out. So it'd be a form of ongoing revalidation. So it'll only push the date out six months. They're going to keep on watching the webinars. But, <laughs> but that's what we'll try next time around. It puts a little bit more pressure on me because I normally produce the webinars in the last few days <laughs> before the webinar, but I need to actually get my skates on and produce the webinar a bit earlier so I can time to write for question. Yeah, and load that up onto a suitable website and I'll look, use something similar to what the biannual check is for the operations. And then we'll mess around with trying to configure how that talks to the IT system in GFA land. Thanks again. Thanks very much for See what I'm looking at.